Today we're going to talk about programming, which is something that I think is very essential and fundamental to understand and know how to do if the goal is to improve your movement, feel better, improve your fitness, or do all three things at the same time. We're going to zoom out a little bit, and then we're going to get more specific as we progress through this video. In a lot of my videos, I give specific exercises and assessments for specific issues or problems but rarely do I give the full context of how it fits into an entire program or just simply how to sequence them for the most amount of success. So today we're going to talk about that, but we're going to get into the specifics of what goes into a program itself. So let's start at the very beginning. Most people's programs constitute a general block progression meaning that they're going to do one thing, then they're going to move on to another set of blocks or exercises, and then they're going to go through generally three to four of those before finishing off their program or training for the day. A lot of the exercises I discuss in my YouTube channel and also other types of content are more ground-based in nature. They're not going to be very taxing on the system and they definitely shouldn't be, but they're there to open up ranges of motion, open up movement options, and then use more muscular-driven strategies to own that range of motion. More on that in a second, but a lot of these drills are really helpful and beneficial in a warm-up setting. So generally, when I'm designing a warm-up, my goal and my thought process is how can I open up the range of motion for this individual based on their needs or and or specific to that day's work and exercises. So what I want to do is open up the ability for the joints to move in the positions that they need to move in. And then I'm going to usually use more muscular driven strategies to help them own that range of motion. Let's say we had a deadlift or lower body pulling workout. That means that we probably want the ability to effectively own a hinge pattern. And as I've mentioned in the past, hinge patterns are more internal rotation in nature, meaning that this sacrum right here is gonna to need to move forward, and then you're gonna to have to have these innominate bones rotate in, and then the femurs can follow in. If someone's missing internal rotation or I want to drive it more, then I can use some sort of variation of an exercise that's going to open up that space to allow these joints to move into internal rotation. And we can do that through something like this rolling arm bar right here. And I'm sure I've showed this in other videos and content in the past, but I love this for opening up the space because you're going to be using the floor to compress that pelvis right there and bring this closer together so we can drive that internal rotation without them moving into deep levels of hip flexion where some people tend to get a little bit locked up. So that's going to allow us to open up that space, but we're not really using internal rotation muscles to do that. A good follow-up to that would be some sort of exercise like this, where we are recruiting the muscles that help drive that internal rotation, because now we've opened up a little bit of space for this to happen. So then we can allow the adductors and the anterior glute med, the obliques, and other internal rotators to then own that position and move in and out of it actively. That's going to be really helpful for prepping us for when we actually need to drive internal rotation on one or both legs in that hinge pattern. Now these individual differences do exist and there are cases in which I'm not going to give someone entirely internal rotation specific work. Maybe they're not ready for it yet. Maybe they need to control the orientation of their pelvis front to back first before layering on that internal rotation. Maybe their internal rotation is already good and they need to work on more external rotation. In a lot of these cases, they're going to be doing other things that are not entirely specific to that day, but the general progression and flow is going to be the same. We want to open up that space as they need it or, and or specific to that day, and then we want to use more muscular driven strategies. Next we have the main block, which is usually, as I mentioned earlier, the heaviest lift at the highest intensity because the central nervous system is the most fresh. So I'm a fan of letting people push the weights and do whatever they need to do to drive that intensity specific to their goals. I'm not here to give someone the feeling that they're going through an entire corrective exercise program. I want people to chase those goals and feel like they're progressing. And I want them to do that as much as they can without me interfering too much or giving them things that are going to be more movement focused. Although we can give them a little bit of both later on in their programming. But this is the point where we would want to 
do that barbell deadlift, do that trap bar deadlift. And then we are probably not going to pair this with anything that's going to be fatiguing because this is going to be so taxing on the system as a whole, we want to provide adequate rest. In some cases, I will pair a certain breathing drill or a certain positional drill with this because it's not going to be fatiguing. And maybe I don't want to make their warm up 15 minutes or 20 minutes long, but I still want to give them something that I know they need. So for example, let's now take it to something like a squat. If someone was doing a front squat as their main lift, then they're probably going to need the shoulder flexion, the ability to keep those elbows up. A lot of the times what limits that is a poor ability for the scapula to glide on the back rib cage and also tight lats and just overall compression of that back rib cage. So if I can give them something like a door frame or rack lat stretch and have them open up that space and decompress that lat. Not only is that going to allow them to get more mobility for the lift that they need to drive the stimulus that they want, but breathing slowly through it in between sets is going to help downregulate their nervous system a little bit so that they can improve their recovery in between sets. This isn't something I'm going to do all the time, but it's a very useful tool if used appropriately. Next, we have the secondary block. And depending on the individual, I'm going to be thinking about this block a little bit differently. If they don't have a lot of issues, I'm going to pick something that's going to help push them towards their fitness goals, something that's going to allow them to drive that adaptation. But here I might be thinking a little bit more about how I can get the things I care about for optimal movement of joints and also allowing them to push that weight a little bit more. Let's stick with the lower body pulling example training day or the deadlift workout. In this case, in the secondary block, I'm going to be thinking along the lines of what can I do? What exercises can I pair together that are going to help them push those adaptations that they want? But also I'm going to be thinking along the lines of more unilateral based work at this point. So in this case, we might think about something like a staggered stance deadlift or more of a lateral hinge variation where we know that they can drive a high amount of load, but they can also get a little bit more of the movement quality and the variability that we're looking for. Because we know that staggered stance activities are really good for creating relative motion dissociation between sides of the pelvis, which helps us restore variability or maintain movement options. The higher the intensity or the more weight that we lift and the more taxing on our system, we're going to be more biased towards moving through this orientation of the pelvis and the upper body as a whole. This allows us to stiffen up and lift the most amount of weight, but also if that's the only thing that we do over time, we're going to lose this relative motion and dissociation between bones within the pelvis and the upper body at the scap and the rib cage and the shoulder, and that's going to limit our movement over time. Again, we've got to ask ourselves, what kind of a person are we working with here? What are their limitations? Do they move pretty well already? I'm going to be less concerned probably, but if they do have issues, I'm going to be thinking about what can I do to still drive that adaptation, but also get a little bit of this movement back as well, because you can still drive that fitness outcome that we want in a position that allows us to access more of that relative movement. Let's say that this lower body pulling workout was complemented with some upper body pushing activities because generally speaking, those muscle groups are not going to interfere with each other and they're not going to take away from their ability to execute the next set because they're just entirely different movement patterns. So at this point, their upper body pushing muscles like their triceps and pecs are going to be a lot more fresh. So I might give them something like a dumbbell bench press and complement that with a lower body pulling activity that's going to allow them to get more of this movement back. That could be something like a staggered stance deadlift. And we can do that even with something like a trap bar, or we can do it with just kettlebells or dumbbells. If someone had a lot of issues and they still want to do an upper body press complemented with that lower body unilateral pull, I might think about something like an alternating press where they're going to be getting that alternation of the rib cage and joint actions between sides of the body, which is going to be better for that relative movement of the upper body. So the general idea here is the more someone is locked up and or the more they care about their movement quality, the more of these things I'm going to program earlier on within their training session, but also I need to keep in mind the main goal, which is for most people fitness.
In the tertiary block or the accessory block, these are going to be more isolation focused movements. These might be things like your biceps curls, your triceps extensions, your lateral raises, things like that are going to be more incorporated within this third block or tertiary block. This is going to be the least fatiguing block. So at this point, we can really drive a lot of this movement quality because we aren't using really heavy loads, which are going to force us to tighten everything up in our whole body in order to execute the lift because they're more isolated in nature. So what we can do here is still drive a lot of so we can still get a pump here, we can still drive some hypertrophy, we can still use loads that will drive a meaningful response and adaptation, but we can also do this in positions that will allow us to restore variability. An example of this might be an arm farm, as some people affectionately refer to it as. In this, we can do something like a biceps curl, which is going to drive some rotation of the trunk and expansion of the upper back. And we might pair that with something like an inverted triceps extension, where they can still push a little bit of weight, still get that pump they're probably looking for, and feel like they're working hard, but for example, in the triceps extension, they're going to be in a hip extended position. So I'm giving them a lot of what they want, but a little bit of what they need as well. Another example might be an ab burner. Let's say that this person really needed to work on their obliques and their six packs were really overdeveloped and they needed to work on the ability for these obliques to control the tilt of the pelvis, but they also wanna feel like they're getting a good ab workout. So I might pair a couple of exercises together that help target specifically that. A couple of examples could be something like a active Copenhagen plank and also some sort of cross connect side plank where it's dynamic in nature, it feels engaging, but also I know that they're getting a little bit of what they need within it too. And these positions are not easy, so it's going to feel like a true workout to them. And because I work with a lot of people who have one of their primary goals as restoring movement or improving how they feel, I'm probably going to have already based on their assessment, some of these more ground-based drills that I'm having them do at home. So it's usually going to be somewhere between two to three exercises. And if I'm going to have them in the gym, I'm not going to be having them do three sets of those things before they work out because that just takes too much time. And they're in here for a workout. They're not in here to do a bunch of corrective exercises. Although they are important for these types of people, I will usually just have them do one to two sets of those before they work out. And then when they go home later that night, I'll say, okay, do one to two more sets of those. So that way we can maximize the time we have in here. Here's an example training day that takes into account all of the things we had discussed in this video. Obviously there will be significant individual differences in how I go about programming this, but this is going to be a general layout. If you want several more examples of different types of exercises and prep drills you can do specific to each type of day and also the mechanics behind it and why I would choose those, check out the article I wrote alongside this in the description below. The last thing I want to discuss is that we ultimately are going to be progressing exercises or changing exercises. And we want to do this in a logical manner. So usually what I will do is at the end of a given X amount of weeks, most people are ready for a deload, meaning that they need to back off of the amount of volume that they're doing to help give themselves a chance to recover from all of the stimulus and muscle damage that they've accumulated over the last X amount of weeks. The deload is a perfect time to switch from that back to front squat because we are going to be inherently less efficient at that front squat. What allows us to progressively overload and add more intensity or volume over time is the ability for us to be efficient at that movement in the first place. Our intermuscular coordination, the ability for our muscles to work alongside each other in a given movement pattern is going to be a little bit neural in nature. It's going to be a little bit driven by the brain and the ability for us to be efficient in that movement pattern. And there's no way, unless we've already been doing that exercise and we've taken some time off of it, that we're going to be able to be as maximally efficient as possible. So we need to relearn the movement a little bit. And this is where I like to introduce new exercises because that's going to give us a week to become more efficient at that. And then we're going to be able to start layering on more intensity and volume.